I do have a history with inner source, but more than that, I have an, a history with open source. And my personal motivation to get into inner source actually was to draw people into open source communities. So I'm co-founding director at the inner source commons. I'm also a member of the Apache Software Foundation, and I'm open source strategist at Europace, which also means that I'm doing a ton of inner source within Europace. So moving forward, why do people start with inner source? We've seen in the um, inner source um, survey that people want to reuse code, that they want to bridge organizational boundaries, that they want to rise, raise code quality. But it also means that people get more motivated because they can unblock themselves and they want to, a, want to have a better way to deal with dependencies. So that is how on the next slide, InnoSource can help you. Let me ask you two very brief questions. Um, if you move to the next slide, how many of you have felt like fixing that myself would have been way faster. Can we just have a very quick show of hands? Don't tell me that you've never had that feeling. <laughs> okay, how about um, being remote? How many people are fully remote um, in more than one office or have remote individuals? If you could just uh, raise, yeah. That's more people then. So let's move on. What does the ideal team look like? Ideally, if you skip on the next slide, a, we have a focus team which is motivated, which is challenged. If we look towards agile teams, these are like pizza sized teams. They are very tightly knit and we try to cut dependencies so that these teams can move very quickly. So on the next slide, you see the pizza size team. On the next one, you see how that team is um, very coherent, is working to very in a very focused way towards a goal. So on the next slide, I have depicted that as working on a Lego brick. You are part of a bigger whole, but you can design your brick pretty much the way you want. You can decide on the color, et cetera. If you move next, that little Lego brick in reality, so belongs to a very much, much bigger thing. And that means no matter what you're building, you are never in moving in isolation. So you're always part of a bigger thing. Um, being part of a bigger thing within um, software means dealing with dependencies. Anyone who's ever written Java like I have probably has said something like Maven's downloading the internet. Now it is likely more like Gradle. Same happens with um, JavaScript dependencies or what have you. So while your team within your company may strive to be fully functional, if you look underneath, you still have technical dependencies because you're not re reinventing the wheel, obviously. Now, if we move to the next slide, we will see that we have technical dependencies. However, if, if you think closer, actually, those are team dependencies. So that's what we have on the next one. Um, we ha still have dependencies between teams. Even if you have a tiny startup with just two or three developers working within one team, they are not reinventing the wheel. So now you have dependencies on the open source teams. It's exactly the same thing. It's again, dependencies to a different team to different people. Now, what if within one of those dependencies, you wanna make a change? Traditionally, what you can do is option number one, next slide, um, wait for the change to be made. You remember that from HR, you go to the other team, you tell them to put your change into the backlog log, and then you wait until it's prioritized. It may be faster for that team to make a change compared to you doing it and getting up to speed and everything, but you still have that ramp up wait time where they have more important stuff to do. Option number two on the next slide is you cut the dependencies away. You build a workaround um, you re-implement whatever you need, etc. Again, not ideal. 
on the next slide, you see what open source people tend to do. So they are shaking their head and going like, why don't you just provide a helping hand to the other team? In open source, it's this translates to going to the mailing list, making a fix, and it doesn't have to be a code fix. It could also be something like documentation fix, um, et cetera. I submit that over and um, makes the dependency better for everyone. Like let the boats rise for everyone. Now, if you think about doing that at a large scale within a company, every developer working in whatever repositories that sounds like other chaos, and that is where on the next slide, InnoSource comes into play. We've got the InnoSource Commons where InnoSource um, practitioners gather and we take what's been working in open source and translate it into patterns that you can use within your organization. Now, the funny thing is that you can translate those patterns back and become better at dealing with your open source dependencies. So essentially, the next slide tells you that it's inspired by open source. It brings open source collaboration into corporations. A lot of open source projects do have best practices. They do have certain ways of working. And if you become part of them, you will learn them. And if you become part of that early on in your career, you cannot imagine working in any other way and you cannot imagine how everyone else doesn't know how that works. What we have learned over time, though, is that that learning doesn't come naturally um, and that it needs a bit of translation for others to understand. And that's why we have a learning path, why we have patterns. Um, and that is also something which on the next slide is something that you can translate around. So what I have seen is people have been using inner source patterns within the company, but then moving towards open source, even just using downstream dependencies, they became better at understanding how that works. So if you look closer to your tech stack, if you're the green bubble in the middle, you may have dependencies within, which may be the orange bubble, but you also may have dependencies outside, which may be the blue bubble, but essentially dealing with both could be done by the same patterns. Now, if you move to the next slide, there's a tiny little bit, um, there's a tiny thing that is starting to be different, at least in Europe. If you sell your product and it contains dependencies, both in-house in and open source, um, then you want to provide support to your customers. You want to provide um, security, security fixes. And if you don't want to do that, Sierra A will mean that you have to do that. So you will have to be able to ship updates. In order to do that, you will have to manage all of these dependencies and be able to make those updates, not only to the code you own on your um, local little repository, but also own the entire stack. So that means on the next slide, being accountable means being conscious of the selection of your dependencies. It means, okay, can you move? Thank you. <laughs> it means being able to fix, to create fixes yourself, but it also means understanding um, what the governance model of the, the dependency is that you're pulling in. You're not only pulling in a, a tech dependency, you're also pulling in a community. Is that still healthy? Will that still be maintained by the time you have to ship updates or will you have to assume ownership for that? You will also need an understanding that contribution tends to be cheaper than making the fix locally and uh, maintaining it locally. Why so? If you make a change to your upstream dependency just because you need it. If you maintain that locally, it means with every update upstream, you will have to adjust it and reapply it. It's much cheaper if someone outside um, has that already within their build system. So there is a tiny little um, rephrasing on the next slide because in open source, what we hear often is sharing is caring. What I've learned at Apache is that sharing is not only caring. There is a way to gain by sharing, to pool resources, to work on the foundation together, and to move faster with whatever is differentiating for you. So the funny thing is that if you take all of the borrowing stuff within your stack, so it isn't the things that you sell to your customer, 
you can share the load of maintaining that. And that is something you learn both in open source and in inner source. Now, if you skip to the next slide, the interesting thing is that what's front and center for many is the open source license. But what's more important is actually looking at how people collaborate. How open are they? How open are they to um, sharing control and sharing the roadmap? Now, if you skip to the next slide, um, this is something that I've often heard from people. They understand that it's important to participate, that it's important to understand how open source works. But what I hear, hear from many, many groups, it, be it researchers, be it students, be it senior engineers who have been in the industry for 20 years, it's that open source participation is hard. Why is it hard? It's public. Every mistake you make will be persisted, will be searchable, and will be linkable. That's not something that people are generally comfortable with. So it's persistent, and it means every mistake you make, but also every good thing you make, will be visible for there for the next few decades. It's also that every community is different. If you think towards a tiny company or a mid-sized company, it means that typically sometimes they've got coding inventions for the entire company. Uh, they have built system for the entire company. They have one code control system. In open source, it's different. Every community can make a different choice. Also, the project check stack may differ. So maybe something that solves your problem, but it's not in your favorite programming language. So you need to quickly ad adapt to being able to, to deal with that. Another challenge that I found with people is simply just knowing where to look, knowing that there is a contributions page, knowing that that typically tells you where people hang out online where office hours are, or just knowing that for bigger projects, say Kubernetes, you do have office hours that you can dial into. It also means knowing where to contribute. Often if I tell people, hey, make a contribution, what they think of in their head is to write a new feature for the project. But what the project really needs is a bug fix, could be a build system fix. It could be help on the mailing list. It could be help on whatever discussion forum, helping new users get up to speed. So people need a better understanding of what contributions look like. And practicing all that in the open is tricky. On the next slide, so the funny thing is with InnoSource, you can practice that in-house, in a safe space. And in parallel, what you can do is to open the door towards upstream for open source. Make it easy within your company to make open source uh, contributions. Check out what kind of legal hurdles there may be so that whenever you have a colleague who wants to do that, that's actually really, really easy. So that is something you can do in parallel. Now on the next slide, um, the funny thing with inner source is it comes with, with role definitions. And in one way or another, those same roles exist in open source. So what we have in inner source is on the next slide, the trusted committers. Outside in open source, they may be committers, they may be PMC members, they may be maintainers, they may be code owners, but essentially the concept is the same. So on the next slide, you see what these people do. They are not only the ones reviewing codes, they are the ones mentoring, enabling, and inviting new contributors. They are the ones setting house rules and project direction. And they are the ones leading by example, communicating openly and transparently so that other contributors can follow along and find where they can help. And most importantly, it's a role that is filled voluntarily. So it is a, it, it's an invitation and you can decline the invitation. It's not an assignment. And that's also something that often people have to learn. So on the next slide, you have the contributors, you have those in pretty much every open source project. And what they do on the next slide is they start with using the project. You don't just randomly contribute, but you start where you need, your need is. They start with watching the project, following conversations, 
following what the project does, maybe even going to meet up some person. They make changes where they are needed, and that may not even be code, it could, could be documentation. It could even be looking back to open office. There, when they were open sourced, the code comments were in German. So the contribution was just a translation. And they contribute those changes back and over time become part of the project itself. So what that means is that communication happens in the, op in the, in the open. If you skip two slides, we will see that decisions are made where everyone can participate. If we look towards the inner source comments patterns, that's captured in the communication tooling pattern. And there is a direct parallel between open source and inner source. You will find that the same issue tracker usage that we write down in the pattern, you will see in open source as well. On the next slide, we've got that rule of mi casa e su casa. So everything that everyone always stumbles over is written down and contributing or read me. Again, something that we've written down as part of the base documentation, as part of our issue tracker usage. It's also something where we've written down in a pad on how to do, um, how to establish a standard release process and why it's better to uh, follow standards instead of re reinventing your own um, release process. If you go further, you can share your work in progress. And again, that's some things that we've written down in a pattern called praise participants. That's feedbacks that I personally have gotten quite often, at least from a German culture, that coming from an open source background where the only currency I have to motivate people is um, telling them what they do well, I tend to praise people much more than others. What we've also written down is transparent cross-team decision-making in order to come up with kind of standards with coordination. But what's also different between open source and in-house projects is when people suddenly understand that the same um, processes and mechanisms they use in order to make code decisions could be used in order to make team decisions. Like where do we want to store stuff? How do we want to write stuff down? What are our um, criteria for rejecting pull requests? That's also something you can do asynchronously. And it's not obvious in the setting where you have people go to the office and see each other every day and they go to, to a common table. It's something that they can learn from these patterns. If you move on, um, there's also learning about goal setting and reward processes. What you learn applying InnoSource in-house on how to change, modify how you set goals for your employees and how you set up your reward process. You can learn more about that in our learning path. That will be something that comes in very handy in open source. Typically, these processes are geared towards um, the person making the DC decision about goals and rewards, seeing everything you do. As soon as you move to open source, that's no longer within their day-to-day -day work. And if you move into foundations, these people may even disappear completely because they are part of now of the say, board of directors of one of those organizations. And that's not visible to your manager. So you need different, um, different ways in order to judge what they are doing and in order to run through reward processes. On the next slide, there's also who, the question of who gets to make which decisions. And that's very interesting. What we found in InnoSource is that there are some pro projects which benefit just from doing pull requests. And from the outside, they look like regular InnoSource projects open to contributions, etc. But they don't have the time and um, cycles for that. So what we've done is to write down a pattern on governance levels, where at the very lowest, you behave as if you'd be an open source, inner source project, but really you don't accept contributions, you just go through the asynchronous communication route. At the second level, you are at a pair, uh, at a, in a space where you do have the time to do a bit of mentoring, you do, do accept pull requests, but you yourself, you want to keep control of the project. 
of the direction and of the strategy. And then you have any of those projects which are shared between teams, maybe platform projects, where the strategy is, oh, can we move back? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> where the strategy is that it is shared and that decisions are being taken together. Now, if you take these um, steps, you can mirror that to open source, the lowest level being source available projects where essentially it's proprietary, but the code is shared for convenience. The second level would be something like vendor only projects where contributions are very welcome, but you will never get um, um, commit access. And the third one would be more like vendor neutral projects where decisions are shared between different business entities. And all of those are valid levels, but they do dif differ in terms of incentives and in terms of what you can do. And it's fairly interesting to learn the differences between those. And you can start with that in Innosus because it's fairly obvious as soon as you start an Innosus project that you have to uh, make a decision about that. But after going through that thought process, you will be much more conscious making a decision which dependency to pull in. And you will suddenly understand the differences and you will understand that there's more than just a license to look into. If we skip further, what you learn is that both inner source and open source helps build bridges between teams, both inter internally and externally. And what you will learn is to balance business interests such that um, both parties benefit. So on the last slide, what you will see is that people move from blindly using you know, so just looking at the tech properties and license properties towards being much more conscious in, in terms of which um, dependency to say pull in. And they move from being a user to a contributor, both in inner source and in open source, but also really at the inner source commons. Can be as easy as adding yourself as a user to one of your one of our patterns, or it can be changing our patterns, improving them, it can be improving the learning path, or it can be participating in our working groups. And with that, I am done with my slides. And I would like to leave with that invitation to you to participate.